Welcome to Brain VR podcast. We are sitting in, here in melting pot on colors of Ostrava in Czech Republic with David Mickey. David, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me on. Uh, we are so grateful to have you here. Uh, you came all the way from Australia, if I'm correct. And, you know, th for me, this is like a special moment, actually, because I've read three of your books. You have many more. But I've had, I've read Dalai Lama's Cat. I've read Mindfulness is better than piece of chocolate, or better than chocolate because in Czech it's a piece of chocolate. Okay. Um, and and another of Dalai Lama's Cat. Uh, I think there are two more, right? Uh, two two more of those or um, one yeah, more. Yeah, there are five in total. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And these books were just uh, such a nice, um, you know, soft introduction to Eastern philosophy, to Buddhism, to principles of Buddhist thought. They were kind of a, a little, little key to some uh, to something inside me, which opened my world to this to this kind of thinking, to these perspectives, and they really made my subjective subjective experience a little bit better day by day. Uh, so thank you for that for your work. Well, thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm absolutely delighted that yeah. it had that effect for yes, you. Yes, because uh, that's the reason that I wrote those books. Yes. I wanted to ask you if you could introduce yourself. So now we know you are an author. Uh, what, did, what do you do? Is there anything else that you do or you are just an author and writer? Well, very, very fortunate for me. I can now spend most of my time writing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do principally. Um, I spend every day, a good chunk of every day writing and meditating and I go to the gym mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And what is the message you're trying to send to the world through your books and other things? I guess the messages, because there'd be a number of them, uh, but they all derive from uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which is m the tradition that I follow. Uh, and because I feel that uh, Tibetan Buddhism has so much to offer each one of us personally, and it certainly transformed my life, and I want to make available to other people as um, widely as possible some of that same wisdom because I feel um, it's important I almost have a responsibility as somebody who has experienced firsthand the profound benefits that can be uh, uh, experienced uh, I should share it with others if I have the capacity to do so. Um, so what were your experiences? We usually ask, uh, ask our guests how did they come here to this point in their life that they are you know interested in these topics and whatever do they do in their life, what were the decisive moments that affected, affected you the most? There have been so many, uh, it's really hard to sort of pinpoint, but for example, what brought me onto the whole path of meditation initially was that I was working in, most of my life I spent in corporate public relations, mm -hmm. working for large companies in the financial services sector. So typically banks, insurance companies, um, mortgage lenders, the kinds of organizations that most people yawn when they hear about because it's just too boring. Um, but they are organizations which I actually paradoxically found interesting to work for because they produce a lot of statistics and out of statistics wonderful stories can be told. And so that was my job for many of my clients was what do this set of data, what does it actually mean to the world out there, how can I tell a story from this data that would be of interest to the media. So that's what I spent most of my corporate world doing. And while I really enjoyed that, uh, when I was living in London in my early 30s, I was working for a PR agency, which was really a very stressful experience for me. And although I found it very, it was a thriving environment, very stimulating, it was like almost too stimulating. And one day I had an itchy, uh, uh, itchy ankle, mm -hmm. and I, you know, uh, reached down and gave this little, uh, little red dot on my ankle a, a scratch. And then the next day I had a different itchy ankle. And uh, to cut a long story short, I was soon being covered by ant bites I thought but it turned out not to be an ant bite at all uh, in fact my entire back was a rash of hives at one point so off to the doctor I went and he said well, you're probably suffering from some sort of allergic reaction um, take these antihistamine tablets whenever you feel a, r a itch coming on and it will go and so I did and it worked to treat but after a while about two months I thought I can't spend the rest of my life walking around with a little bottle of pills waiting to feel itchy um, this is some you know all I'm doing is masking the symptoms rather than addressing the cause and so I went as it happened to see a naturopath because a flyer arrived on my doorstep one day saying you know I can deal with all kinds of allergic reactions and she said David you are systemically stressed 
the only thing that you're going to do to deal with the stress is to meditate um, because meditation has a, a, a massive impact on both mind and body which of course are directly connected so um, I thought well I'll give it a go for six weeks uh, and I made that six-week commitment um, and I thought if the at the end of six weeks if I'm not feeling any improvement then I'll I went you can say hand on heart I gave it a try and of course I did find within six weeks I was having a massive difference um, interestingly um, I came to work one day and everything that could go wrong did go wrong by lunch by lunchtime I was feeling extremely uh, angry and pissed off with everything and I asked myself why am I feeling so totally irate and I realized I'd forgotten to or not hadn't I postponed meditating for several days I hadn't meditated and I discovered for myself the truth of an amazing statement made by the Buddhist sage Shantideva many centuries ago when he said you can't cover the world with leather to avoid stepping on thorns but you can wear leather on the soles of your feet and what he meant by that is you can't control reality but you can control the way you experience reality and that for me was my first uh, insight into the benefit of meditation is that it's almost like an insulation it's almost like wearing a layer of insulation and if you don't do meditate on a regular basis it's sort of like walking around in the bush barefoot you know you're you're going you're in for a world of pain um, but you can actually uh, counteract this by through meditation that's just that's just one of the very minor benefits to me now of meditation so that's what led me to meditate and once I began on that course being a kind of curious person I wanted to read about meditation you know, who recommends it why what are the benefits and the more I read about it the more I discovered Buddhists seem to have a lot of insights in fact a lot of meditative practices came directly from Buddhism and so meditation led me to Buddhism um, and that's how the journey all began mm -hmm. uh, how old were you at that point around 30 you said uh, yeah early 30s early, early 30s yeah okay. I would like to ask you about a specific part of your life that you are struggling with uh, depression can yes. you tell us what did you take out of the state what helped you well I, I have suffered from depression I, I guess since my uh, early 20s um, and I can I can point to all kinds of things in my external world that were the apparent causes of the depression and despair. Um, and I went to see a, a therapist. My my parents sent me off to see a psychologist um, who asked me to uh, write down all the ways in which, for example, being dumped by my girlfriend made me feel depressed. And I wrote a list of things like. Um, Without Juliet, I will never be happy, and um, I'll never meet, meet anyone like Juliet again. And at the next session, he said, "You don't realize. You do realize, David, that um, uh, were you were you miserable your entire life until you met Juliet? Well, no, I wasn't." Um, and he addressed all these these th thoughts that I had and pointed out the simple truth that it's not really the things that we believe that that are happening to us that cause us to feel depressed. Depressed. It's our interpretations of those events. And he said there are some some guys who are dumped by their girlfriends who are only too relieved for that to happen and in fact one of my best friends only the week before was jumping on his bed with a can of lager I can still remember he was so delighted he'd just been dumped because his girlfriend he'd, she had saved him the effort um, so basically it's true there's nothing in the well, very few things in the external world that are um, in themselves a cause of depression it's the way we perceive apprehend think about so it's our thoughts beliefs and about those events that make us feel one way or the other and this of course is directly uh, what what happens in cognitive behavior therapy what all psychologists um, it's one of their tools in their uh, in their kit bag that they apply to their clients and that is absolutely fundamental to Buddhism too it's the, the idea that it's not reality that makes you feel something it's your thoughts and interpretations mm. about that reality mm. This is a really important topic. As we come from neuroscience background, there is this there are a few principles that are really similar to this because we don't perceive reality as it is. If someone thinks that they perceive reality as it really is, it's called naive realism. But we are in something different. We are in like this model-based realism. So our brain is actively creating models of reality, models of ourselves in the reality and the in the relationship between those. And this is so important right now because we can realize, okay, so I'm not perceiving reality as it is, and maybe I'm perceiving it, perceiving it in a different kind of way. And maybe this bad event that's happened there, maybe it's not such a bad event after all. Maybe I have a wrong model of reality and I have to, you know, actualize it. I have to kind of reset it or something like that. Does meditation help with that? Does it actualize models of reality that we have? 
It absolutely does. And mainly because when we sit and meditate, there's a particular form of meditation uh, when we observe our own thoughts called mind-watching mind. Um, and just as a sidetrack, we can read any number of books we like. We can study neuroscience. We can study philosophy. We can study psychology. But the only way to actually observe our own mind directly is when we meditate and, and observe our own mind in, in action. And when we do that, we notice that thoughts arise, abide, and pass through our minds constantly. Um, and what meditation does, among other things, is it makes us perceive thoughts as just a thought. It's just a bit of cognitive ac activity. Um, instead of uh, what we normally do is concretize the thought and we start to believe in the thought as being a truth, um, as some sort of, have, it has a sort of validity which it doesn't deserve. And so when we meditate regularly, we start to lose that, um, thoughts lose their control over, over us. Instead of being um, managed by our thoughts, we become better thought managers. And we get far better at letting go of negative, of, of all cognition, but especially negative cognition. That is one important element of, of meditation. But there's another more prof far more profound benefit, which is in, the, in, in Buddhist teachings, um, this self that we cling to so tightly, which is part of this whole perception that we have, when we try to find that self, we cannot. We can go through our entire physical being from the tips of our toes to the top of our head. We can go through every aspect of consciousness and if we're trying to apply the label me, myself, or I, we cannot find such a being. So that's one of the profound, um, this is one of the where neuros neuroscience, or certainly quantum science and, and Buddhist thought converge completely. Because, and so all that we come to in the end is that, yes, we do have a me, myself, and I. It is merely a label for a collection of psych physical and psychological um, uh, events that are constantly evolving and unfolding. That's all the thing called I, David, whatever it is, is um, and meditation can help us to perceive that and when we have that and coming back to your question about profound things that have occurred that is the most effective way that I had to get rid of depression because what I would do is I'd sit down on my meditation cushion and this is not the CBT answer this complements it though you sit and you think okay I'm feeling depressed yep I feel very depressed well who exactly is depressed let me find this depressed David and after that 20 minutes, I can't find a depressed David. Um, and so it's kind of, you start to really realize how ridiculous the whole thing is. Um, and in fact, just to touch on this, there's a wonderful book I would highly recommend if you haven't come across called Einstein and Buddha, The Parallel Sayings. It's edited by Wes Niska. And it's, it's got a, it's about, I don't know how many chapters, 10 or 11 chapters that look at all the different dimensions in which qu quantum science uh, they use Einstein, but they quote a lot of different scientists, and um, and Buddhist thought uh, uh, converge. Uh, and one of those sayings is a wonderful. Um, Erwin Schrödinger um, uh, said something along the lines that reality is something uh, that arises from the mind and cannot be found to have any other reality. Uh, so, so physical reality arises from mind and cannot be shown to have any other reality. So, and Buddha said something very, very similar, uh, which is that observer reality is a product of the mind mm -hmm. so when we actually meditate regularly we s these are no longer just ideas they start to uh, impinge on our own awareness to the to the extent that we start to realize that everything like even this moment we're enjoying together you are a projection of my mind i'm a projection of your mind anybody else here would be looking at the same thing and having a different experience again mm -hmm. Yeah, it's those models of the reality that we create in our in our minds. Uh, I will come to that maybe later. I wanted to come back a little bit back because I'm really interested in starting of your writing career because you've you know dealt with uh, some failures, some rejections lots, of lots. novels you were writing. You wanted to be a novelist, right? Yeah, I wanted to be a writer since the age of 18. I was, had a burning passion to become a writer. And um, from the age of 18 to the age of 32, I wrote 10 entire novels, um, all of which were rejected by every publisher that I sent them to, and, you know, whether they're in London or New York or Australia, whatever, um, they were rejected um, for one reason or another. I kept on persisting because I had this very powerful self-belief that I'm going to become a writer. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of failure. How long did it take you to write those 10 novels? Well, I suppose the majority of my 20s were spent shackled to my desk writing books, which is not what a young man should be doing, frankly. Um, <laughs> but that was me. Um, and I, I just had this uh, very, very strong desire to become a published writer. 
what was your strategy then to overcome this uh, feelings of rejection to keep on doing what you were doing it I, i can imagine it was such a hard thing to overcome these kind of feelings and keep on doing what you were doing because the world literally was telling you not to do it and you, now we are sitting here after you just uh, released your newest book the follow up of uh, Dalai Lama sketch and it's like you achieved your goal but then it was a really big struggle how did you overcome it i suppose i used a number of um just very typical worldly tools because at that point i wasn't a buddhist okay so for example i i tell myself it's like 11 hours or, or 23 2350 minutes um i only got to keep on doing this for 10 minutes and the doors will open <laughs> so it's like the kind of things that i think marathon runners do to try and just keep focused and keep on doing it um there wasn't a you know i just had a very burning and single minded passion to make this happen and i do i believe that um that is important because i think in any artistic p- pursuit you're going to have far more rejections than you have acceptances and also i'd read a lot of biographies of of authors and i realized that what was happening to me was nothing unusual what was unusual in my particular case was how i got my very first publishing deal because it wasn't anything like what i'd imagined i had thought that one day i'm going to send one of these novels to a publisher they're going to say fantastic this is just what we want we'll accept it and run with it that wasn't what happened what happened was i was working for this pr agency which i mentioned earlier i didn't have any time to write i was so busy doing my pr work i didn't have time to spend the evenings you know writing the great great next great masterpiece so what actually happened was i decided i'm going to put all that to one side for the moment i hadn't given up on it but i just thought i've got to be realistic i've got to focus on my career at this point and at that point as i as you will know now i started meditating and about three months after i started meditating i was going for a walk in the park and i turned to my wife and said you know everyone's talking about tony blair and tony blair spin doctors because that was that was a big thing at the time in in britain in the early 90s because they'd never really talked about spin doctors before in, in relation to politics or well, they weren't quite so visible and i said you know the thing is that i've been a spin doctor my entire life that's all that i do i know exactly how spin doctoring works i know who they are i i know the how they operate and i think the public out there would be interested in this and so i wrote a a, a short proposal of about five pages I wrote one first chapter of what this book might look like. I sent it out to half a dozen publishers, and within a few weeks I had my first publishing deal. I did not have to write an entire novel, um but I managed to join the dots. In this case, the dots were I know about something, other people don't know about that stuff but they're interested. So, how can I close the loop on that? And so the the very first publishing book publishing deal had nothing to do with Buddhism or Dharma or 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 you know important uh, self development it was about spin doctoring um and but i think what is really important is that i can't prove this but i have no doubt in my mind the reason that i was able to join the dots was because i started to meditate and when we start to meditate we get better at reducing the thought pollution as i call it in our minds our minds are we're constantly like agitated thinking 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 and that was me before as well when i was writing all those books that got rejected i was always thinking and plotting and trying to work out something whereas sometimes we what we really need to do is step back from something and instead to um uh, allow possibilities to emerge in a in a more calm state and so meditation um really enables that and i have the saying that um uh, creativity is an accident but we can all learn to become more accident prone uh, and we become more accident prone by putting ourselves into a state where it's possible for such things to happen like if you're feeling stressed out and angry you will not have any creative ideas however if you're feeling a little bit playful and childlike for example then it's easy for creative ideas to arise and so that's that's how i attribute that breakthrough so it's directly to meditation This is really interesting because uh, I there is also the dots are connecting for us as well. We talk about uh, we talk a lot about meditation. And the thing is there is so much research in cognitive psychology, in cognitive neuroscience that stress kind of, you know, shifts and lowers your creat- creativity, your perspective. Your pers- perspective is narrowing. You are not able to think as clearly as you would without that stress. And it feels like we have this mental model of uh of uh, noise versus signal. And it feels like sometimes that 
our mind produces a lot of noise, some signal, but we are not really used to listen to signal that much and we sometimes get into the noisy stuff that's going on. We have to kind of clear that out and I f it feels like I need to meditate every so often just because I'm living life. Because living life means I'm having experiences and if I'm having experiences there is going to be some noise. There are, there's going to be some things, some experiences that I have to integrate. Needs and to be processed, yeah. And the integration is simply I sit down and I listen and I let the noise, you know, bubble up, do whatever it needs to do and let it go. And then I can, as you said, I can step back and I can find a signal. And this is this for me is like one of the most important things and really important thing for, you know, finding who one is, who, who we are as a, as a person. So was this part of your journey to find who you are as a person? What do you like in the world, what you don't like? And, and do you think this is like important part on the journey or you can just go a different way or is like self-knowledge and, you know, no, look, obviously I'm a, I'm a believer, which is why I meditate. Yes. But one thing that I find instructive is that in the West, we are fixated on the material and on the external. Um, and our science has, has always been geared towards that. Um, and for example, in, when it comes to our physicality, uh, in the West, we have always worshipped people who are fantastic performers in sports or really um, you know, fantastic tennis players, football players, bodybuilders, whatever it might be. The, the original Olympics started, I think, in 300 BC. So we've been doing this for a long time, focusing on the physical. If you look in India, they've, been focusing, they've had that same intensity of interest, but on the mental. And a long time before the first Olympiad, they were debating and discussing means of internal growth, and they, they worship the people who have been amazing, who are amazing performers, because they, they know that these people can do things that ordinary mortals cannot. You know, just like you and I cannot, well, I, possibly you, but not me, could run a marathon tomorrow without much difficulty. You know, these other guys could do, they could see exactly what's going on in your mind. They could even walk through a wall. They could, um, they could see what's going to happen in 20 years time. The clairvoyance means clear seeing. There are, the, men, the mind has a capacity completely beyond what most of us can even imagine. Um, but in the past, especially, and there are still are people today, people know that this is simply the result of mind training. And there are so many parallels between training the body and training the mind. I talked about this at one of the melting pot sessions. So there's, it's not like magical. We're not talking about magic here. We're just talking about um, optimizing our well-being. And if we want to optimize our physical well-being, we know that we, we mustn't eat a lot of junk food and we should we exercise reasonably regularly to be healthy. There is no such thought that we should do something mentally but just as we exercise the body we should be exercising the mind and exercise the mind in this case means meditating so um, and just as like physically in good being an optimal condition means you can deal with whatever life throws your way physically if you have to run upstairs or carry heavy luggage or whatever you can do so without any effort if you're fit physically similarly if you're mentally fit you can deal with whatever life throws your way emotionally speaking psychologically so you're more resilient and robust so i just feel in the west we up till now have been quite bad at recognizing that just as we do we look after our bodies we need to look after our minds i feel that that's starting to shift and has in the last few years possibly because there's been so much burnout with social media and external events in the world and covid and all this stuff um, but I think you need to place uh, as, um, as great importance on m training the mind. The topic of your talk here in Melting Pot uh, was really interesting for me. Uh, it was why stories are so important for inner growth. And I would like to ask you which stories affected your inner growth in your life? Gosh, um, there have been so many. Um, there is a particular story that my godmother told me. Am I allowed to, 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 to or should I t talk about actual events that have been relayed to me in the form of a story? Yeah, sure. yeah. Sure. My godmother um, uh, went to Tibet in the early 1950s before it had been invaded. She had a personal question that she really wanted answered and she wanted to ask an enlightened being, who she perceived to be a Lama, uh, that sort of person, to answer the question. 
So she went all the way from London to Lhasa, um, which took a long time. In those days, the plane would stop many, many times. Mm -hmm. And eventually went to a monastery outside Lhasa with a small group of tourists and was shown around the monastery. She was really hoping for an opportunity to ask the abbot or some important lama her question. But at the end of the trip, all there was was a question and answer session in a courtyard with a whole lot of other lamas standing around. And she didn't want to ask this question, which is a very personal one. I think it had to do with her marriage. Um, and so anyway, the, the, the tour ended. She went out. Uh, they were all being herded out the gate. And one of the very elderly lamas who had been standing on the side of the courtyard uh, beckoned her and the translator over. And he said, the answer to your question is... She had not answered. She had not asked the question. He had been able to see it, um, and when she told me that, it sent like shivers down my spine. Um, and I thought, this is extraordinary. These people really do exist. They are people who have developed their minds to the point that they can actually see quite clearly what's going on in yours. And that was the first story, if you like, that it planted a seed in my mind that was only to germinate many years later. Um, but I always had this fascination for. The idea that from training the mind through meditation and applying Buddhist techniques, you could actually evolve to that extent. Uh, do you have another one from your uh, uh, personal experience? Another from my personal, in terms of stories? Yes. Um, gosh, it's hard to think at this point. Um, there have been so many times. I would like to go and to make it really practical for listeners. Because, because meditation sometimes seems like this ungraspable thing, you know, people really don't know what it is, like what do you do, do you have to sit in a lotus position or something? I would like to kind of demystify meditation a little bit. What is meditation for you? Um, and mainly what are practical steps to start meditating? What is important to focus on? And I think, you know, we are speaking words here, but it's about the action that people can do in their life on everyday basis basically that will change their life I totally agree um, I often liken mind training to physical training in the sense that you can go into a gym and know the use of every single piece of equipment and how it will help you unless you actually do it mm -hmm. it's, it's just it's just irrelevant information you know you've actually got to apply it so the, the, to come back to your question what is meditation I like, I like to use a definition which I think is very widely accepted by the likes of John Kabat-Zinn, etc. Mindfulness um, is paying attention to the present moment deliberately and non-judgmentally. So in paying attention to the present moment, what does that mean? We're, not, we're basically what neuroscientists would call we're in direct mode as opposed to narrative mode. We're not attending to our thoughts, we're, direct, we're attending to what we are seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, whatever. Um, so that's, and it's deliberate in the sense that it's, it's easy to focus on something for a moment, but it's deliberate to keep, on, keep your mind fixed on that point because our minds uh, have the habit of, of wandering um, uh, and basically then the um, uh, it's non-judgmental in that the moment we make judgments about an experience we are having a conversation with ourselves about the experience instead of experiencing it and therefore we're in narrative mode so we need to be non-judgmental so that's mindfulness and what I always say meditation is is as the application of mindfulness to a particular object for a particular period of time. So you could be mindful of your breath for 10 minutes, for example. You could be mindful of a visualization for 10 minutes. So that's how I would answer the question, what is meditation? Um, in terms of uh, sort of simple steps, I would suggest that you really do need to uh, apply mind meditation at least five or five or seven days a week. Um, without that, it's a bit like fitness training. You're not going to, if you do go in fits and starts, you're not going to get anywhere. Some, the analogy sometimes used is like rubbing two pieces of wood together to create a spark or fire. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just stop start. You have to keep on going until you create system. There's been a wealth of research that shows um, all kinds of things like the fact that you need to keep going on it, the so-called dosage effect. You know, that's, uh, I don't know where you know Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, but he looks at why some people are successful and others not. And um, the Berlin Conservatory did an interesting research of, of their graduates to see why some people were, became concert performers backed by a symphony orchestra and other people were actually in the orchestra and other people actually went on to become music teachers. They kind of graded them or scaled on that basis. And they found that nobody in the top tier had done fewer than 10,000 hours. So there is a dosage effect. The more you do, the better you get at it, etc. So uh, those are just some examples of the practicality of it. Another thing I always emphasize is that just like when we go to the gym or do physical training, we're focused on exactly what we're doing and for how long. Um, and, and similarly, when we meditate, you know, what am I going to do for how long? But the whole reason we're doing it 
is for the 23 hours a day we're not at the gym when we're able to run upstairs or carry luggage or and similarly for the 23 probably and a half hours we're not meditating we're actually better able to deal with stuff so there are so many kind of practicalities but making meditation part of our daily routine i think is important and i always in, in, invite people to do what i did which is simply set yourself the six week challenge say for six weeks i'm going to try to meditate five days a week that's all okay for six weeks if at the end of six weeks i find no difference at all then I can say, hand on heart, I gave it a try, it didn't work for me. I've yet to meet anyone who can say that, because you will find after six weeks there are certain benefits uh, you will have experienced. Your concentration improving is something that, mo that is the reason that most people stop meditating, because they think after six weeks I should be able to meditate now for 10 minutes without thoughts appearing. But after 10 years, I can promise you will still have thoughts appearing. But what you will notice in the short term are things, for example, like your way of dealing with stress will be far enhanced. You will come up with creative ideas far more easily. They'll just readily appear, as you said, it's a signal. And also life will se seem somehow much more vivid um, because there's less thought pollution, there's less stuff interrupting your experience, whether it's of music or drinking coffee or whatever. I have a quote of yours that I would like to read. The main shift you see is from placing self at the center of our thought to putting others there. It is, what do you say, a paradox that the more we can focus our thoughts on the well-being of others, the happier we become. The first one to benefit is oneself. I call this being wisely selfish. This is so interesting and important because even in neuroscience, we can track the activity of the brain and the people that are considered selfless in their brain their, the part of the brain that is activated is, is part of the brain that uh, that rewards themselves so even at the basic neuro neuroscientific level neuronal level the selfless people are neuronally selfish but this is the wise selfishness that you talk about actually you help others that makes you feel good that makes them feel good and who benefits first one is oneself yes and then the the other one are are there some some of like similar principles or could you comment on this a little bit more uh, to explore this topic sure. a bit are more? you referring to richard davidson's work Rich Davidson? I'm yeah. not sure. Because he's sure. a neuroscientist who actually put this into the test. Okay. What he did was he's, he has this concept that there is like a bell curve of happiness. Mm -hmm. Some people are off, off happy a lot of the time. Okay, Some people are unhappy most of the time. And in between is most of us. So we, we fluctuate. And, and But we all have a default happiness point. And he said, is there any way that I can move that point? We can, we can learn how to. And the one thing he discovered was... Uh, meditation and so what he did is he got people who were um, complete non meditators taught them how to meditate and he, he put them in an fMRI machine and scanned their brains um, when they were meditating um, at various points and he found that there was a definite shift in that default happiness point uh, as a result of meditation but what was really interesting and directly relevant to what you just said was Matthew Ricard the famous French uh, Buddhist monk um, who was formerly a scientist himself but then became a, mo a monk and had spent many years in Bhutan he basically um, was put in the machine as a very experienced meditator and his the, the brain scans was completely off the charts in, in terms of the yeah, yeah. left prefrontal, prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex um, was lit up bright blue which is the happiest thing when he meditated um, and because he was such a proficient meditator they could ask him to meditate on different things and they found that when he meditated on loving kindness of, and, and applying to others was when that bright blue effect was at its most radiant mm -hmm. so as you say there is now scientific evidence that placing our compassionate attention on others uh, directly makes us happy even if you look at it from a purely neuroscientific perspective um, I like to be very kind of practical about it and think just subjectively on our own experience when are the times that we've been most miserable the opposite of happiness and what were we thinking about that at that time and when I was depressed I was thinking about how unhappy I am that I just had another rejection from another publisher or how unhappy I am with my love life or whatever it is that's making me unhappy it's always about me myself and I I'm always at the center of it but then we think well, when are the times that you most euphoric uh, really joyful and, and pleased usually you find it wasn't just you usually you find there are other people around at that time so we we can have our scientific true uh, evidence which is great but we also have our subjective experience which we can relate to and I think when you invite people to look at their own experience of life 
um, they will say the same thing. That was uh, kind of my next question, but I'll ask it anyway. How Buddhism can improve our relationships and which practices like through it we can use? Gosh, there are so many ways, but one way I'd like to share is um, when people really irritate us, um, which they do constantly, of course, <laughs> 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 depending on the people. But Buddhism has this concept of precious treasures, and I like to share it with people. So um, if somebody in your life is, is constantly irritation, it's probably you, usually your boss, um, uh, you can uh, th reframe that person as a precious treasure. Why? Because um, in, uh, in providing you uh, with sources of irritation on an ongoing basis, he or she is doing something which none of your friends or so-called loved ones ever do, um, <laughs> because they're giving you a chance to practice patience. Patience being the opposite of anger. Um, and uh, in Buddhism, the ability to practice patience is considered to be paramount because uh, getting rid of anger is our anger is our main uh, source of misery and unhappiness. Um, and and so we need to cultivate the antidote, which is patience. So um, learning learning that it's not all about me, and learning that people who are irritating can actually give us a chance to to cultivate our own patience. Uh, is a bit of a game changer in the, in the sense that it's, you're now regarding this as almost like an experiment. Oh, here he goes again, but I'm not going to rise to it. I'm just going to let it wash over me. And sometimes you even find that in deciding to make that change in your attitude, it changes their attitude. Because they think, he's not, he's not being triggered by this like he, he usually is. What's going on? And um, it, it can shift the dynamic in relationships sometimes. Um, but but certainly that um, also that lack of attachment, lack of strong attachment to a profound sense of self that we were talking about earlier can help because you realize who is the one who's being angry you can look at this in so many different di dimensions but certainly practicing patience and re reframing irritating people as precious treasures is just one example of how Buddhism can help us um, improve our relationships I have another quote of yours <clears throat> the most people think that their only option is to change their circumstances but these are not the true causes of their unhappiness It has more to do with the way they think about their circumstances. And now we co come all the way back to the start, as we talked about. And I think this is so such an important thought because it connects also the, the Western philosophy as, you know, Stoics had the same thing. It's not about the circumstances, but it's how we uh, perceive them and how we kind of maybe respond to them. And the Buddhist have a similar thing. What are some practical ways if I am I tend to respond in some way? What do I do other than just meditate? How do I change my response to the circumstances around me? How do I accept the circumstances which might be really, really harsh? Maybe, I don't know, someone maybe died. Uh, how do I deal with this grief? Do I block it? Do I accept it? What do I do? Hmm. Well, I, th I do believe that meditation is actually the kind of core or the kind of ground for or all of this meta kind of a meta hack for that I yes think. it's very hard to it's almost like exercise if you want to be a really fit person you can get incidental exercise by running upstairs <laughs> instead of catching the lift <laughs> but it's much better to actually do some proper training you know so it's it's a bit like that but one thing i think is important is that um to bring back is thinking about your circumstances uh And, and like you say, it's a stoical thing, but it's also the basis of cognitive behavior therapy. And the one problem with cognitive behavior therapy, however, is that you may know that it's not all going on out there. It's coming. It's in my mind and I need to do something about it. But you still feel miserable. You still feel upset. You still feel whatever. Um, and that's a totally normal human reaction. The wonderful thing about being more mindful, which meditation helps us to do, is that in that moment that you're starting to have these negative thoughts, If you have the sufficient distance that you can just see I'm having depressive causing thoughts rather than I am depressed, that is a total game changer. And so it requires that mindfulness in the moment of that unhappiness for us to be able to distance ourselves, if you like, from it. Um, there's a big difference f between saying I'm a depressed person to saying I'm a person who's having depressing causing thoughts because you can do something about depression depressive causing thoughts you can't do anything about being a depressed person except take drugs you know? so um, that is I think the magic of introducing mindfulness to CBT or cognitive behavior therapy and that is something that originates 
both of the things originate in Buddhism, but they're also being recognized more in the West. And so there's this thought now that mindfulness-based cognitive behavior therapy is the way forward. It's about interrupting that cycle that we get locked into. And actually at a corporate um, training session I was, I was doing once, a CEO once said to me uh, at the end of practicing meditation for the six-week trial, he said, you know, what this has done for me has given me a second, an extra second. I said, how do you mean? And he said, an extra second between being given some piece of information and me responding to it. Because in the past I would have just reacted, but now I'm just taking a mindful moment and I've realized that the way I would previously have reacted is one of several options. I can still do that if I choose, but there are other things that I can do. It's about being able to almost like be a spy on your own mind, your own consciousness, observing your own responses to what's happening and realizing it that the response that you might have done before automatically is not the only one. This is, uh, this is something I've experienced myself after I've de decided to dedicate myself for one year meditating every day. And after like one and a half month, after two months, I've experienced this bubble of time before I respond to something. And this, it, was, it was exactly as you, as you talk about. And we have this concept of meta mindset, which is actually how to cultivate some mindsets or maybe get rid of some habits. And the first thing we talk about is that, okay, you first have to notice for maybe a few days, few weeks. And then when you notice, you can actually have the response ability to change the response. And then you don't have to. Then the funny thing is you actually don't have to change the response. Maybe get on the, you know, get on the way as you've responded before. It's totally fine as long as you know about it. And then you can cultivate this bubble of space, bubble of time, cognitive flexibility, as in a, that would be said in cognitive uh, neuroscience and psychology. Then you can expand this bubble and then you can change it. And I think many people want things really fast. And that's sometimes a problem because we, you know, we are in this rush period of modern world. So maybe if you agree, if we th should take things slowly and not want to change things super fast, because sometimes that may lead to frustration and frustration may lead to, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore because it doesn't work and I need to fast. So how, what do you think about that? No, I totally agree. Um, I think we live in an era of instant gratification. If, like how angry do you get when something on your computer doesn't work instantly? Uh, we've all become so used from all these different inputs, electronic and digital inputs, that things should work like this. But when they work slightly sl more slowly, we get irate. Um, so while the world around us is, is speeding up, our minds are just the same. Um, and so I think the, paradoxically the best thing we can do is to, to cultivate more space, is to in fact meditate so that there's less um, mental clutter going on. But I just want to pick up on one other point that you meant about, that we talked about earlier about external reality versus our experience of external reality because I often reflect on a simple thing one summer night I was in back in our little courtyard in our in our house and the cat a uh, little cat came out and looked uh, really really agitated her, her tail was flashing going like this which is always a sign that they're angry um, I had no idea because it's a beautiful peaceful balmy summer's night and then she walked to a particular part of the garden looked up and I realized that there were rats running along the top of a hedge and she could hear them squeaking to each other. Now we believe that we can hear everything. We just assume if you can't hear it, it doesn't exist. But the, of course our, our hearing is very limited compared to a cat's hearing. Similarly, our sense of smell is very limited compared to a dog's sense. They have dogs in Perth airport they take around for, for you know, they can pick up on stuff. And so I think it's really fascinating when you think that The, our ability to perceive what is actually happening on a, even a purely scientific basis, we, we only get a tiny, minute fraction of what's going on. Um, and there are so many kind of, you know, if you look at us in terms of being in a, in a bath of waves, the amount of information that we're able to perceive, is, you would probably know far better than me as a neuroscientist, it's, it's like less than 10%, 5%, I don't know, it's a tiny amount. But we have this assumption, we all, this, we assume that we know what's going on because we can see here and smell and taste and touch, but we're actually pathetically limited. Um, and there could be things going on right in front of us or even between us at this moment that we're unable to apprehend. And I just find that fascinating because that also ties in with a whole lot of thoughts that are sometimes dismissed as being superstition um, that Buddhists have that, 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 you know, maybe there are all kinds of other beings that exist in, in reality that we cannot 
to perceive, but maybe we can't perceive them because we are we have, we have such profound limitations. Um, this is uh, you know this topic fascinates us bo- both as well. I think there are like two things come to mind. We are really trying to be because we are bi- biologists, so we are really really scientific. But what we missed in science was this field of subjectivity. Everything was only objective, and people didn't look inside of themselves and didn't apply the things that they were that they were, they were studying. That for us was like kind of ah, that's a little bit weird. Why then they don't apply these things? And the second thing is, we are always open to something we cannot know. We know that we only perceive like one person of reality, maybe more, maybe less. We don't know. We're not sure. But for us, it's the most important to be open to the possibilities that are unknown and you know you can you can go through scientific method you can go through reason through thoughts for through your own experience and maybe arrive at something which is you know more likely or less likely and we are always trying to be at the point which is more likely so it's a combination of yeah you know science is such a cool method it's scientific method that is so precious because it's not dogmatic it can repair itself it can self enhance itself that's the that's the point and that's why we actually love science but we also consider ourselves spiritual non-religious spirituality is really close to us because if you look at the universe you realize oh the stuff out there the stars three of us came from the same star the atoms that make this machine around we are, us we are all stardust yeah we are yeah, all, all constantly being re- reorganized yeah, yeah. And, and it's so fascinating to think okay so i am part of the universe i'm i'm matter which has subjective experience and it can realize itself and i can realize the universe so universe is realizing itself this is very alan watsi right yeah, he, he yeah. talks about this a lot yeah but i love this so much and this for me is spiritual the nature for me is spiritual and and the, the that's really for me it's really similar to buddhist perspectives but for this is the point where the scientific methods and the buddhist perspectives and thoughts can come, come together i totally agree i think we're at an exciting time in human history when for the first time we have equipment that was that is sufficiently and technology is sufficiently advanced to be able to be sensitive enough to measure things and to evidence things uh, that up till now have been impossible to prove um, but what for example meditators may have told us from the past and uh, i think having an open mind to everything is is critical and i really love the fact that the dalai lama often says if science can prove that something in buddhism is not correct buddhism will change so um, if we all if we because scientists can also be as as dogmatic um, you know there are many bits of science which have were held back for a long time because of the beliefs of scientists which turned out to be incorrect mm-hmm. um, just as you know you could have the same in religion of course so it's good to approach this with a with a completely open mind I, I totally agree and what your point about nature I think is so important because one thing I do every year coming from Africa originally I take a group of people on a mindful safari in the middle of Africa and we meditate in the bush and we observe animals and it's the most extra- incredible experience. I want to come. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's, it's just an extraordinary thing. I've got a little thing on YouTube called Reconnecting to Nature. It's a video which you're welcome to see. It's about five mm. minutes. Okay, we'll put it in the show notes. Oh, thank you. So the bottom line is that I one of the meditations that I use is to um, help people become aware that you know these people are coming typically from big cities in america europe whatever and they arrive in africa in the middle of nowhere and i always say you probably feel that you're just arriving in nature and you got it's nothing to do with you you just arrived from some other planet kind of thing metaphorically speaking and here you are in your kind of um outfit uh c- going out in the bush for the first time but then i point out to them when they're nicely calm state meditating um you know every single breath we take in we are breathing in oxygen where did the oxygen come from It came from the trees and the plants. Um, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. Where is that going? It's going to the trees and plants. They need it and we need their oxygen. So we're in a transaction, constant transaction with the world for oxygen. And your body is 90% water. Where did the water come from? It came from the sky, you know, one way or the other. Uh, whether it's river or underground source for 100 years, doesn't matter. It came, it's, it's natural. And your body is made up of, of what? Of, of material, where did that come from? Your food, where did your food come from? The earth. Everything you ate, you know, every piece of, you know, whether you're a meat eater or, or a veg- vegan, it doesn't matter. It came from the earth. 
and and this and none of this could possibly work were it not for the sun source of warmth mm. because in darkness nothing thrives and so we are walking embodiments of uh, air water earth and sunshine we are nature um, this, you can't get more natural than that it's like you say it's sort of self-organizing in a way it's, and once people have that pointed out to them uh, as they're sitting there in a nice calm state we d with that breaks down this barrier between me and the outside world we realize that we are all walking uh, embodiments of nature Beautiful. Thanks for integrating this topic into our talk. <laughs> and now let's talk about kittens. <laughs> These uh, little, cute, marvelous creatures. Because you recently released a book called Awaken the Kitten Within. Yes. And I would like to ask you maybe why? What does it uh, give you? What How? Does it what does it mean? What okay. does it mean? And have you become one? <laughs> well, in all my Dalai Lama cat titles, I try to, they're, they're a bit of a play on a well-known book in the same genre. So the, the Power of Meow, for example, is an obvious Eckhart Tolle reference, and um, The Art of Purry is The Art of Happiness. And, and so The Awaken the Kitten Within is a nod to Awaken the Power Within by t Anthony Robbins, or Awaken um, the Buddha Within by Lama Surya Das. So there, are, there is a like, precedent, if you like. Uh, what is Awaken the Kitten Within, or where does it come from? Basically, the book starts out with the Dalai Lama's cat being taken for an annual checkup to the vet, where she discovers that she is now a senior cat. Um, and uh, she wonders, does all I have to look forward to is potential kidney problems and cat biscuits for seniors, which is not a pleasant, pleasant thought. Um, and basically, it's confronting the, th the fact that we are all aging, we all grow old, um, and death is inevitable. These are subjects that people don't like to think about. Um, but in Buddhism, we do like to think about it. We talk about it a lot. Uh, death is not a taboo subject. It's quite the opposite because we have the strong feeling or belief or view that uh, only when we confront death, which is the only known uh, fact in our existence, uh, can we know how to live life. Yeah. And it's so far from being a negative, uh, de de depressive thing, it's actually an incredibly positive thing because when we realize our death is an actual reality, not as some hypothetical thing that's around over the horizon conveniently but something that is definitely going to happen to us um, then we realize my god how amazing is it that i'm even here sitting you know in this comfortable chair speaking to nice people it's just it's just an incredible thing to be even experiencing it really makes us realize the true value and the preciousness of every moment of our life and so that is that um, is an empowering thought it, it makes more um Uh, makes it more possible for us to start behave in a more kitten-like way because we are now actually grateful for the for, for, for what we have and so there are many different subjects that flow from that but that's the overall premise of awakening the kitten within not not in some sort of a naive um, jolly hockey six type of uh, view but much more from a perspective of that um, what we are experiencing right now is unique and precious There is some beautiful concept of uh, of play around us because like animals learn uh, by play with themselves and we used to play a lot like when we are when, when we are little children and we just like kind of uh, forgot how to play when we are adults and but the play is still around the play is just really serious because we play the roles we play the social side situations we just like uh, made the deals that we are gonna behave in a certain ways so what else is it than some kind of place some kind of games but they went serious what do you think about serious play and does it uh, does it speaks to you in some way um, I haven't really thought about it like that but what I do what what we all do notice is that people do lose their childlike Their ability to be childlike. Um, I think the one the reason that people like having pets and in fact babies is it like gives you permission to be childlike. Nobody thinks you're odd if you make silly baby noises at a baby or at your cat or dog. It enables you to, and we're completely uninhibited with animals, with our pets, you know. We take off our clothes quite comfortably with them, we perform all our bodily functions, you know, it doesn't, we're not freaked out by it, like, we wouldn't behave like that in front of a human being. Um, so I think kittens and other animals are, are ideal for that, uh, enhancing our childlike um, uh, response to life. But um, one thing, once again, I, I sorry to keep harping on meditation, but I really do believe that when we meditate regularly, it enables us to Um, experience the world in a more fresh way, a more childlike way. And there once again has been fascinating research done 
in the context of music, people who perform in orchestras, which showed that even people who played like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony a million times in various different orchestras, if they meditated regularly or were taught and they started to do it, they could actually re-experience the beauty of what they were doing as though it was fresh. Um, and that freshness came from the fact that um, it, it ena- when we meditate regularly, it enables us to experience things from a less jaded, cynical perspective. Um, another interesting thing is that you guys wouldn't know because you're too young, but as you get older, time subjectively seems to speed up. In fact, there's a book entitled Why Does Time Seem to Speed Up? And it's the answer give to that is given that when you are young, like in your teens and early 20s, experiencing things for the first time, it's, it has a big impact on us. And it's like, but if you've done it like 10 times or 20 times or a million times, by the time you get to 50, you're like an autopilot. You're no longer present because you can do this easily. It's almost like, you know, when you learn to drive, it's you're freaked out by all these things you've got to do. And how can I turn the wheel and push down the clutch and do it? It seems overwhelming. But, you know, in a few years time, you're doing that and smoking a cigarette and listening to the radio and talking to people. You can, it's effortless. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so why can you do that? Because you are doing this on autopilot. And sadly, many of us start to live life on autopilot in many respects as we get older. Um, and we, that's, that strips away any childlike possibility. Um, so it's very important to kind of meditate in order for us to experience the world anew once again with a freshness. This is also something people tend to forget kind of to step back again. The meditation allows us to step back and realize, oh, I'm doing this wonderful thing actually. We often realize like we have to stop ourselves and like just like, what uh, what are we doing? Like we are talking to the people that we admire and it's our job kind of? Like is this like is this real? And that's what also gives me the um, the memento mori the thinking of the death right because yeah. okay i have existence which you know nowhere is written that i'm going to be alive the next day or that i should have been alive you know I, i i didn't have to exist right and that's okay so this is kind of i can perceive it as a bon- bonus and if you perceive it as a bonus everything is okay even bad things that i experience it still is an experience and it's still a better better thing than no, no experience and yes. this for me is like su- such a game changer and Confuci- Confucius has brilliant quotes on this he has we are we have two lives and the, we and we start to live the second when we realize we have only one that's a brilliant quote I love that one too it's yes. one of my favorites yes I'm interested in your subjective experience actually it feels like you are really like order or orderly person like you, you have you like to have things in order and stuff like that Uh, and I'm I, I, I'm wondering how your mind works, kind of, because we are in, al- always interested in how the other persons perceive the reality. So, how do you think? Do you think in maybe images? Do you think in words? Do you think? Do you have some voice? Maybe do do you just feel things or? What is it like to to be you? Uh, <laughs> Gosh, uh, I've it, never it, been it, anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, no, that's not quite true from a Buddhist perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I've been plenty of other people. Yes. So, so if, if it's even possible to uh, to, to experience, to, yeah, I know to, exactly to, to what you're asking me. To experience, basically. I find it really hard to um, because literally I've never been anyone else. But just from my observation, I I don't think I'm a particularly um, impulsive, spontaneous person. I tend to absorb things, then decide. Um, I think I tend to think in terms of um, words rather than and in, in images rather than feelings. I think I think I'm very structured in the way that I think um, and um, like to have an. Uh, you're quite right. I'm a very orderly person, organized person. I even have quite a routine in my life, but I find that I can be more productive when I'm in a routine. If I don't, if I don't, if you don't have to keep thinking about things like in the army and in n- nuns and monastics, they don't have to think, what am I going to wear today? You know, you wear your uniform. That's one less decision to make. You know, Barack Obama used to joke about when he left the White House, he'd, he'd only wear the same clothes every day. And I think Mark Zuckerberg talks about you know mm-hmm. it's, it's stripping away the dis- unnecessary making decisions so I, I tend to like to live like that too um, because I find it helps my life be productive but then on the other hand I love coming to places like uh, the Smelting Bot mm-hmm. Forum where it's like every day is totally chaotic got no idea like you approach me today I've got no idea what's going to happen in, in one hour's time um, and but I feel I can live that life more fully uh, coming from a more Uh, organized context because my life is not one of complete uh, anarchy mm-hmm. anyway I'm not sure whether that yeah. helps yeah, yeah. but yeah. one question I have for you guys mm-hmm. is that from a neuroscientific perspective what is mind what is mind mm. 
like for me mind is it's just the biggest mystery there is you know like if we are talking about mind uh, like as consciousness as consciousness event so it's the biggest mystery that we are trying to solve like neuroscience is basically trying to find neural correlates for consciousness that you can track it inside the brain and then you can for example predict that when these neurons are activated your subjective feeling appears and like in neuroscience it, it has the practical side because when you know what is the neural correlate of consciousness you can solve some of the problems of consciousness for example when people have a broken consciousness when they are in a deep state uh, of uh, unconscious state in a in a hospital or something like that so yeah back to, back to the question like simply <laughs> simply you just can't can't grab it simply but it's just for me it's just some kind of emerging process that's dependent on our brain and it's generating our subjective angle from which we are look, looking inside the world and that's basically it the content the content is just like the other layers there but the point of view is really like when you use it to the most simple particle there is just point of view from which you are seeing the world and for me this is the breaking point where mind emerges from the brain activity for me it's a space without without qualities a space which is filled with contents with emotions and feelings and uh, and thoughts and stuff like that this this thing is fascinating to me because at this level if the if there is no qualitative property of this space of this point of view of this just subjective thing then all the spaces are the same but the contents are a little bit different because of the point of view because the point of view is unique and then yes yeah, christoph said there is there are all the layers there and there is brilliant ai researchers psychologists cognitive scientists neuroscientists and philosopher uh, joshua buck and he actually talks about how from the stimuli out of the world and from ourselves there is emergent space where actually simulation of like reality happens actually so it's both materialistic there's still real reality we have some stimuli from the reality we create a space uh, the space emerges and in that space there is simulation models of uh, of me and the reality as we talked about before so for me the space that is created is the mind i, I don't know if it, that makes sense yeah yeah <laughs> i would just add something to it because at the same time you can't have any experience of anything that's not your mind like yeah. everything you experience is literal experience of your mind every touch every pain it's interpretation of these emergent principles of your brain which we uh, equals like mind yeah. so basically like this is a, this emerging principle from matter but you don't have any other experience than yeah. is your mind okay i was just interested to know whether you're going to say that uh, mind and brain are the same Uh, and to what extent they are because that to me is a fascinating question in light of things like um, I'm not sure whether you're aware of Eben, Dr. Eben Alexander's book Proof of Heaven um, he was a neuroscientist a brain surgeon in America who basically um, believed very much that consciousness arises from the brain uh, he then suffered from some dreadful viral infection of his brain during which he was placed in a coma and was shown to have no brain activity he then emerged from this And, and reported the most vivid experiences of his life while he'd been in a coma. So you've got to say, well, what was going on there when his brain was not functioning and yet he had... And the other key thing I find fascinating is the increasing incidence of um, near-death experiences, NDEs. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, work on that because, you know, our ability to bring people back to life having died of a heart attack. And sometimes uh, people have experiences when their brains were shown to be dead what's going on there. So I, I, I'm fascinated by the extent to which the brain is important in experiencing consciousness. And, and the model that I have in my mind, a very basic model, is that it's like a television set and a broadcast. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that yes, model. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. For us, it's about replicability, again, uh, the scientific method, because this is... Uh, I, I am familiar with the thought that we are only receivers of the something yeah. uh, which is beyond our comprehension right now. But the thing is with uh, all near-death experiences and, uh, you know, out-of-body experiences, stuff like that, this is all, you know, 
you can always kind of explain it in scientific terms because the the brain the b dead brain isn't really dead brain it has some activity it's just so low that we wouldn't account for consciousness or anything else but there are some different like neurochemical pro properties that that can actually um, affect how the brain works in different terms in different ways and that we don't know because it's such an extreme case of near-death experience for example there is this thought and i, lo I love this uh, it's just a theory uh, no it's hypothesis that uh, dmt if you are familiar this potent psychedelic it's it's um it's it also is in our brain at uh, on some levels but there is this hypothesis that it's released during extreme case of for example hypoxia when the heart stops and there is not enough oxygen to uh, to get to neurons and stuff like that through the blood so the dmt releases because it acts as a neuroprotectant and it may be where it may very well may be that the dmt released during the extreme uh, episode of this i don't know heart attack or something that there comes the near-death experience, the psychedelic kind of similar state. That's one hy hy hypothesis. Yeah, and yeah. But all things come down to that we have our subjective experience and we can manipulate it through several ways. For example, I can give you a set of mirrors and a camera or something and you can see yourself from a different point of view and you can move and it can start to feel like after a while that you are somewhere else, that your mind is out of your body. And you can do this not with, with drugs, with anything, with any substance, just with mirrors. And that for me is so interesting that we can, you know, manipulate the experience, the subject ex experience in ways that are very similar to most crazy descriptions of near-death experience. For example, also with psychedelics, also th th this yeah, is very yeah. similar. So for me, it always comes down to, okay, um, I think for us, both of us, what is the most probable option? And so far I haven't been, uh, for me it hasn't been proven that I don't have to step out of this view, but I'm, I totally get your view because you have mm -hmm. different experiences, subjective experiences, yeah, yeah. and we are based on, we are more in science, you are more in the Western, uh, 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 Eastern philosophical traditions and stuff like that. So I totally get it, I'm totally open to it, but I, don't, I just don't think it's, it's the case. Okay. Yeah. But Fine. I think we think pretty similarly, but the, the basic thing is a little bit different, I think. Sure. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I still think that these kind of discussions are the most interesting ones. And Absolutely. that's why we are doing the podcast. Yeah. Because yeah. we are we are trying to damage our model for of reality. We're trying to prove ourselves wrong yeah. and just to crash our views of the world like through other people. Yeah. And when someone crashes our point of view it's a really beautiful moment because yeah. you've got insight no no we, we have you. we we always need to be forced to kind of um ask these difficult questions i've i've without the difficult questions we'll just coast along without developing yes definitely yeah and what is the question you would like to have an answer of like in your, in your lifetime life, yeah. What question would I like to have answered? Yes, like from from anything, from, from universe, anything. from like from this world. What would if you be? could have one answer to one of our of your questions? What it would be? Gosh, that's a big one. Um, I I would I think I'd probably go back to the question that I asked you, which is that what is the true nature of consciousness? Um, I I have the Buddhist answer, which is that a mind is a formless continuum of clear knowing. Um, but I would like to, uh, and I've experienced uh, that to some extent, but I would love to have that answer to that question. Because I think once you, once you know that, once you've had it uh, as a definitive statement, then that'll tell you how to live uh, and what to expect as well. Um, is the Buddhist model correct that uh, a very subtle consciousness or energy continues after life? Or is it not correct? Um, you know, we, we have our beliefs, we have our views, we have our, uh, just like you have evidence, we have evidence. But am I only focusing on the evidence I want to focus on and not the other evidence? You know, uh, am I being subjective in my perception of the evidence? That is, that to me is the, I suppose that is the, that's at the root of everything. You know, uh, what is the nature of consciousness? Beautiful. Do you have any last message you would like to send to our listeners? Well, with our question, I would, I think I'd go back to that beautiful statement over the um, Delphi, or, um, Delphi, the Delphi Oracle in Greece, which is know thyself. 
And, you know, that, that is the, at the heart of what I think we're discussing is like, what is the self that we're learning to know? It's not the David Miku, the biography, who writes the books and was born here and lives there. And that's all well and good. But it's more like, what is the, um, what is the underlying nature of my consciousness? And to me, the only way that we can experience that is through meditation. Um, at least we're starting to approach it through meditation. So I would encourage everyone to know thyself to, uh, and how to do that by getting into the uh, habit of meditating. Because I think when we meditate, um, uh, all kinds of things occur. But one important thing, as, as we've discussed here, is that you become less invested in thoughts and ideas and even, um, uh, e even evidence because you realize, well, I'm, I may be right, but I may also be wrong. And, uh, and it doesn't matter. Uh, we don't have to fight to the death over these things. Um, I think it makes us far more open, uh, far, far more happy and far more joyful in our experience of life. Uh, just for this uh, question of know thyself and who am I, who we are, there is a beautiful, beautiful book which can kind of lead people through it. It's called Untethered Soul. Uh, have you read it? I haven't. No, no. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a brilliant book, so I definitely recommend it to you and to the listeners. David, it was such a pleasure talking to you about these ideas and ideas from your books. Thank you for what you are spreading to the world and for all of your books. And thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, David. Thank wonderful. you so much. Thank um, you. Hopefully we maybe do another episode online sometime in the future, in a year or two, when your next book is going to get released. <laughs> <laughs> That would be great. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank Bye, you. David. Goodbye. Thank you. Bring me out.